long day, I got a lot to say. It feels like I'm carrying a two-ton weight. I go to see a friend. Hello, I'm Monsignor Patrick Winslow. And I am Father Matthew Cowd. And we are speaking from the rooftop. A podcast brought to you by 10 Books, in which we invite you to join our conversation out here in the open air. Where we look out upon the world around us from the rooftop of the church and share with you what we see. Makes me wanna scream from the rooftop to the screen till I know I Well hello there. Greetings, good to be with you. I know it is. <laughs> It's always a delight. Oh, self confidence and self delusion. They, well, they, they're so go so hand in hand, don't they? <laughs> yeah, and it, usually my self confidence is unfounded. That's right. Um, I'm reminded of that constantly. Like the time we recorded one of these sessions and I didn't turn the device on. Yeah. Yeah. That was our most brilliant. It was so brilliant. It, ever. Was, it, was, it was incredible. Yeah, but yeah. it's lost now. It's, it's lost. It's known only in the mind of God, and hopefully he forgot it. <laughs> it's like those, you know, those great musicians where they say the lost tapes have been found. Yeah, that's right. They, the they're, lost they're, compositions. Yeah, well, that's us. So that'll be lost. Well, you know, I was thinking um, uh, that I should let you know mm-hmm. uh, very recently that we made a, um, a retreat inside a prison facility. And I know you know this. Sure. Yeah. Because they took two of the seminarians along. Right. And uh, it was really a great experience. For those uh, who may be listening, it's a three-day event. It's very similar to like a Curcio experience where it's like three consecutive days with a series of talk, prayer, sacraments. And it's all kind of moving in a direction toward really inspiring people to take from that experience some momentum mm. and being intentional in their faith and, and, and trying to go from there to a more in a more earnest way, except it's inside the facility. So you bring in, we had probably, I don't know, 25 guys or something as an outside team, maybe 20 guys as an outside team. And we had probably on the inside, um, I don't know, maybe 45. Okay. And uh, it's just an optional thing they can come to? Yeah. So it just, it gets promoted inside the facility and they, uh, because it's a sponsored event, meaning the facility has invited us in to be able to pull this off. It's all monitored. You know, the, you, you're in a, in, in this case, we're in a gymnasium setting, <clears throat> a table set up and speakers and things. And uh, we're able to have all of our sessions there, including the sacraments and mass and confessions, uh, all of it. But they come in at the slot of time to enter and they stay with us all day long. And they're very long days uh, until we leave on Sunday afternoon. But it was successful. It was uh, a wonderful experience. It's a program known as Residence Encounter Christ, and it's meant to have this effect on these men. So I'm going back this Saturday with a group of men, including oh, my dad, who's flying, down, in, flying wow. down here just for the weekend to be able to go into the facility and reconnect Some with follow. the guys. It'll be, it's one month since we were just there. Wow. And uh, we, a, a group of guys from the outside will try to go back every month and connect with them. And then in a year's time, we'll do the rec weekend again. And okay. so we kind of keep it available to the population. And would the men that have been through it, should they continue, whether they come into the church or whether they just, they're deepening their faith if they're already Catholic? The majority um, of the men were not Catholic. Okay. And we have, I think, about 21 who signed up for RCIA. Wow. Yeah. And so it, potentially they will be the ones assisting with the next one. That's right. So they'll come back, um, assuming that they're in the same facility. Yeah. Uh, they would they would be invited back to be part of it as well as invited to be inside team members. How does that work? I mean, you worked you worked in other prisons before up in New York. I remember visiting mm-hmm. a very difficult place with you. That was a ma- maximum facility. Yeah. Yeah. And how does it work relative to transfers? Do, do people typically stay in the same one, especially if it's a life sentence kind of a thing? Uh, it really all depends on your behavior. Mm. I mean, certainly there are going to be factors that are really not about the particular inmate. Uh, about populations and having to shift. So you have a certain proportion number here versus there. But by and large, they have fairly lengthy stints at the various locations. But should they have to uh, be disciplined to a greater degree, they might go from a medium facility to a maximum. Mm. They might go from um, one max facility to a max A facility. You might 
then actually get out of a max and go down to a medium or a minimum. And oftentimes, especially in upstate New York, uh, there are certain programs that would be available at different level facilities. And so uh, men would shift out of, say, a maximum facility because they've been working hard on conquering their addictions. And if they go to this medium or minimum facility, they have uh, basically Monday through Friday, uh, five hours a day. It's like AA work all day long for them, where they're just doing constant type of rehab work wow. on themselves. Yeah. So you can have uh, these types of programs available in some of these um, lesser, less severe facilities uh, because they allow for a certain amount of freedom okay. and be able to attend and participate. So there are those type of factors that depend on the individual, their discipline, their their behavior, the programs that they may want or request. And then there are probably other factors that are being driven by the state itself okay. in determining population distributions. I mean, admittedly, persons are persons. And so every person that comes in front of you is going to have their own story. Yeah. Things are going to be different, et cetera. But in the main, what do you find to be the immediate reaction let's so you've got let's say you've got 25 people that come mm -hmm. obviously there is 100 hundreds depending on how big the place is that chose not to come right oh yeah so these are people that are either looking for something to do that's not what they were doing and before. some of them are mocked for going yeah I imagine so and yet what do you experience the sort of receptivity we just had the gospel you were reading the gospel this morning right. about the seed falling on different Soil. Soils, yeah. You know, so I would say that uh, kind of going into it, you're going to have obviously different degrees of receptivity. Uh, we had a young man who for the past year had been kind of reading himself into the Catholic faith. Mm -hmm. And he knew even before this weekend, because he was meeting with, with some Catholic volunteers on a weekly basis, that he w wants to come into the church. Uh, and then you would have then uh, other men who are coming and maybe they're just coming for the food because it's an opportunity to get something other than jail food, uh, prison food. And, uh, hey, we're okay with that. Sure, sure. You know, come, we're spend not proud. With we'll us. take whatever no. <laughs> incentive. It's, you know, maybe you hear something that will strike you, yeah. right? And we're really open about it. Like, we're not upset that you came for the food. Yeah. You know, we're, we don't feel used. You know, we, we know exactly what we're getting into here. Uh, we want you to be here. And we think if you come for the food, you might actually find something more. Yeah. You know, food for the soul. So uh, I find that uh, the the men, generally speaking, are cautious. They they are going to size you up quickly as to whether or not you're fraud. Yeah, uh, this is necessary for their own survival. Yeah, um, they're going to determine, I think, very quickly whether you're trying to play them, and. Uh, if they size you up in such a way that you're authentic and sincere, it makes, I mean, it makes for a whole different event. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's exactly how we come off because we come, we actually are being sincere. <laughs> so they, we don't have to pretend to be and they pick up on that very quickly. And that garners respect immediately. I, mean, I suppose even just coming in there, there's a certain amount of respect just because Unless you're asking them for something, why in the world would you do this? Like, why would you intentionally right. go into... There's a, there's a suspicion, right? Yeah. Like, what do you, what do you get out of this? Yeah. And uh, they, they learn pretty quickly. You know, what, I remember I, I, I was in the one in New York with you. Yeah. I went to the one that you were in recently. I've been mm -hmm. there to serve the men. And I've not done it extensively, maybe a half a dozen times in my priesthood. And I have to say that every single time I did it, when the door is closed behind me, there's that moment of, oh my gosh, I'm not going to get back out. Yeah. I don't know if you ever felt that. You know, but I, it, 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 I know it's not, it's yeah, rational. I've never felt that. But that's in large part because. Because I'm guilty. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe because I feel like I've gotten away for so long that no one's ever going to catch me. Oh. Um, no, I mean, so like <laughs> when I was in college, you know, my dad started doing prison retreats back in the late 80s, well, late 80s. So when I was in college, I mean, he would make us go in on the Saturday time period where outsiders like my mom mm. could come in. So I would come in. So there was some familiarity that happened for me long before I discerned you know, into the seminary itself. And 
and I would see my dad kind of go in and out, in and out all the time. He was doing these rec programs in upstate New York, but he was also in in between them, whether they do one or two to a year at a facility, he was running Bible studies with them all the time. And it was a joke. I mean, my dad, we would just joke that he'd rather be in prison, you know, because he was right. always up there. But that's how committed and dedicated he was to the work. Uh, it goes it goes to show you um, that in, in these types of efforts, the more you give, the more you receive. Yeah, yeah. You, you get you you really um, you get sucked in because of the goodness that's coming from it, it's and an the impact to be a light in darkness. Yeah, and the impact that it has on real people, yeah. and to understand those situations from which they come, uh, which are complex and difficult, and quite honestly, they're they're. Um, uh, they evoke a certain amount of empathy. In any event, I think because of that, by the time I was a priest and was asked to be a chaplain for the, the facility up in New York, uh, it was all pretty easy. And that prison was like the old-fashioned Shawshank, you know, mm. big skeleton key kind of thing. Mm. The facility that I was just at, you know, more like, less like that, right? Yeah, it was right, a little right, more like right. dormitories. Whereas this, uh, where I was up in, in New York, was was just what you saw in the Stephen King Shawshank film. It was very old world in the heart, and uh, that that would make anyone feel like maybe I'm not getting out. That said, getting back to the disposition of the guys, you know they have they they have to live in that facility, and that is a community. It's not necessarily it's a, community a smaller living, world, yeah, and they have their own norms. And it is, um, how shall we say, not well received mm. when, when you behave maybe in a Christian way. Right. You're breaking up their hierarchies. Mm-hmm. You're, you're disturbing their, their laws, their governance. Norms, their, expectations. Yep. Um, and then all those things we consider to be a sign of weakness. And then suddenly you might be on the receiving end of some some vitriol and, yeah. and harshness. Uh, maybe in violence. And so it's a tricky thing to talk to these men about, <laughs> hey, go live your faith. Well, you know, it's not like they're going to go live their faith in town right. where they have a lot of people who are yeah. living it or, you know, they can rebound nicely. They're going back into a facility where the types of things that we're, we're, we're telling them are not going to be very well received. Yeah. You know, you turn the other cheek in that facility, it's not going to be easy. Is it it's the, hard. Is it the case that in the internal workings of say this, the social structure organization that's behind the scenes sort of a thing, how organized is it in terms of the actual governance system? Like, is there one guy that rises to the top? There are gangs. Typically. But even the gangs, you probably have... There's hierarchy in the gangs, yeah. and there are gangs, yeah. without a doubt. Um, and, and the officers are fully aware, right? This is... Again, they have to deal with the population as it is. They can't ma- pretend like it's not that way. So they know the gangs, they know the groups, uh, and they align. And oftentimes they're aligning in ways that are um, bad. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you might align regarding an ideology of hate about someone or some other sure. group. But you also might align just from an ethnic po- way as well. Or you might align from a background or right. gang initiation kind of stuff. Right, to be a part of something. Sort of protection in that, but there. I mean, there, there were. I mean, these men have families on the outside, and right. these men are, are deeply wounded and hurt. I have to say, that in terms of the types of things that these men seem to have been there for, uh, the a homicide was top on the list, um, and also crimes related to fentanyl. Mm-hmm. Uh, those were those were there. Now, the, the homicide it wasn't like cold blooded murder. It was some bad people fighting, right? That led yeah. to the death to someone. It wasn't like yeah. somebody just walked into a house and started shooting people. Right. It was probably uh, a really seedy scene to begin with. It, one thing leads to another. Anger overflows and someone's left dead. Right. I mean, you, you can only imagine how many, how many persons are in prison that, you know, it was, if I could just go back to that moment. Yep. It is without a doubt. A the natural thought. consequences of yeah. that one moment of not controlling myself yeah. or not taking the drug or whatever that they might have been. Wow. And we talked, like, for example, one you of the know. things I talked to the men about was anger. And, uh, you know, you may not know this, but anger is a response to an injustice. 
Wow, he's, he's, <laughs> I see he's still reading his St. Thomas. This is good. All right, people don't understand the humor there. That's because he's a Thomistic uh, theologian. <laughs> so the ba- sort of Thom- Thomism 101 is understanding that um, anger is a response to an injustice. So real or I perceived. Was, real or perceived, is right? correct. Right, so being a choleric, I perceive anything exactly. as an injustice. <laughs> And I am constantly on the end of that. I ask myself, why do I always have so many choleric friends? I know. I don't know what I do. I don't to, know. To because choleric them. friends can't be friends with other cholerics very easily. Well, I must be. I must gravitate toward them too. Yeah, but you're you're sort of you got the sanguine thing going, right? So it's nice for a choleric to be around someone who's more sanguine. Oh, yeah. Well, that's true. Uh, or more it's a, phlegmatic. It's, it's kind of like putting you know chili pepper into something for just for a, a, like a light kick. You know, you kind of need that complexity, you do. that little you bit do. of heat. To bring you body to the thing. Yep. So it's we had, a recipe. We had, we had a touch of gober and it's like tofu. A touch of gober. It's like tofu. <laughs> it just picks up the flavor that's around, kind of goes with it. So, you know, I'm, it, yeah, I, I get it. All right. So going back to this point, uh, talk to the guys about anger as being a response to an injustice or a perceived injustice and talked about how anger isn't necessarily sinful uh, if it's a true injustice and it's proportionate. Um. And we started talking about different ways in which we can perceive injustices and, and become disproportionate in our reactions. Uh, you could see, you know, these these guys really internalizing mm. because a lot of their circumstances, when the passions yes. ran amok, you know, and the anger became very inflated, extremely disproportionate, and either somebody died or somebody got hurt. And it led them into the, you know, in, into right, the facility. Right, 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 right. And that's that kind of idea of could, if I could go back and maybe I was responding to a genuine injustice, but it should have been proportionate. Proportionate. And that's what's so hard about anger and why we need it. Because it's, it's, if it's a response to an injustice, you, you know, your body is modifying itself based yeah, the upon chemicals the apprehension, inside, yeah. right? So you get the adrenaline, you know, yeah. your heart beats fast. And you can feel it. The old idea is you see red because you, you, in, in those moments, you typically can't think well. Yeah. That's why the old adage count to 10, walk away, do right. whatever, because you really, your body is so taking over that it sort of clouds your intellect at the moment. I noticed this in particular whenever people get angry, um, they go to their easiest language. Remember how people will say in the old days, did you learn Italian from your grandparents growing up or your parents or whatever the language was? Like, no, just the cuss words. Because when they got angry, That's... They re- you revert to the thing that you yeah. don't have to use reason for. And I noticed You're that right. in That's Italian. A good way to put, yeah. So whenever I would get angry in Italy, I would just, I'd start saying something to someone in English and then I realized I was speaking English. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's a good point because it, it's, it slides out more easily. Hard it requires less reason. reason. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just, it's a difficult passion to wield. I mean, our Lord, obviously, um, we talk about our Lord as not having the passions as passions. The reason we call them passions, we, today we call them emotions. But for St. Thomas, he called them passions because that word passio is something that we suffer, something that happens to us. Like we, we apprehend something, like let's say you see someone mistreating your mom, right? You're going to get angry. Um, you apprehended something, and then something happens to you inside that you don't get to control perfectly. You can't control the emotional reaction to it. You suffer it, and you've got to guide it and hone it, shape it. But you can't control the fact that you're having the reaction. That's just happening to you. And that's where you need the cognitive faculty. That's where you need the cognitive faculties, you know, majorly to, to, to give you direction. And to, contr- to do what you can to control. Because are blind in that sense, right? Right, yeah. I mean, your full esteem... Yeah. But you have to come in above it. Yeah. And with a lot of these men, um, they were bearing out Thomism because w- whether they realized it or not, yeah. the circumstance in which they found themselves was that the passion overwhelmed their cognitive faculties and somebody ends up dead yeah. or seriously wounded and you end up in prison That's and your it. family ends up feeling an enormous amount of pain yes. for your absence. And this is a massive consequence for a moment, could for you, everybody involved. Can you imagine having all the emotions, because we're made, made to have emotions, passions. Yeah. Can you imagine having them all under the order of reason? Like all at your beck and call? Isn't that amazing? Like when, so as I say, our Lord didn't, the, the sort of the idea behind the medievals is that the Lord did not have the passions. He had, he had the emotions, but he employed them. 
So like when he wants the assistance of anger to drive the money changers out of the temple, he has the perfectly proportionate amount of anger to the situation. And it's never out of um, control of his own reason and will. And I think that for a choleric, just saying as a choleric, one of the reasons as I get older that I, I, I find myself getting a bit more phlegmatic is because you get tired of destroying things. Yeah. Like you, you, you get angry and yes, you get a lot of things done. You get people hopping, you get things moving, but you, you leave a lot of wreckage behind. And you realize that I, if I just slow it down a bit, I need the anger. It's an injustice. But if I would just slow down a bit, I wouldn't have to go back and fix things. <laughs> I just want to go on the record. What? I forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this was a public apology. <laughs> I interpreted it that way. Yeah. Uh, well, let you... me ask a f- follow-up question f- yeah, with yeah. that, um, just because it's an area I don't really work in a lot. But what do you make of the difficulty that these men that have entered into a new social situation, they're forced into it, they might not have any hope of ever getting out. So eventually you just you, you, you adjust. You say, this is my life. Like, this isn't yeah. living on the outside anymore. Right. This is my new reality. Right. Um, and you, you do watch people. They, they get educated sometimes. They do amazing things, yeah. conversions, et cetera. We even got a saint uh, that, that lived his life after committing a murder in, in hot in, in a France, hot moment. Right? Yeah, in, yeah, exactly. Turned out to be an amazing saint. Yeah. I think now, he was guillotined in the end. Yeah, right? yeah, I think so, too. Jacques. Yeah, I just read yeah. I just read something about him the other day. It was, it was, just, it was fascinating. Jacques something. But... Of course, it's Jacques. That's what every Frenchman says. Jacques. Jacques, right? Yeah, it's true. Um, <laughs> it was one of these cases where he Jacques genuinely Pierre. stole yeah. bread for his hungry family. Yeah, it was, it was something one of those... like, like a Jean, yeah. Jean Valjean, right? Exactly. It was one of those situations. Um, and so when they get out, if they get out, it seems to be so hard for them to stay out. I was working, yeah. I was working with police when I was in Franklin, you know, kind of the ride-along chaplain yeah. deal. And so many of the men that these cops that I was working with had put away, they would get notifications when they'd be released from prison because they're just going to go right back in. Right. And so they would just go look for them because they're going to come. <laughs> they would do yeah. things to get back in because they find it difficult to live back in there the world. There was no change. And why? Or they just can't function anymore outside. Yeah. Why do you? Did you talk to any of them about that? Well, this goes back any to the repeat offenders or well. Uh, you don't really have to talk about it because it's so obvious that the root causes remain. Yeah. So if one of the root causes is a drug addiction, yeah. well, guess what? If drug addiction landed you in prison the first time, it's probably going to land you in prison the next time and the next and the next. If your root cause is an uncontrolled anger and you keep putting yourself into situations mm-hmm. um, where that is going to be sparked left and right, mm. guess what? The outcomes are not going to be any different. Yeah. And sometimes what can happen is the experience of prison um, can work against you. It can make you more hardened and, or it can make you more weak in a given mm. area. So, you know, having opportunities for these men to be able to say, hey, wait a minute, here's, here's something for my hard circumstance and my hard situation. Again, they did bad things to people. Uh, there's no question about it. And to be quite honest, rare is the, the inmate that's going to tell you they didn't. Right. They might tell you why they felt justified in the moment, or maybe they feel like there was a little they did it. there was a little eye for an eye, right? But they're not going to say that they didn't cause harm, at least not the ones that come to our program. Sure. Right? But the, I think that the the difference between somebody going out and staying out has to do with change. Yeah. It's interior change, and that's yeah. really what we're trying to speak to. And you know what's interesting. You know, to give St. Thomas even more props as though he needs them from me. Mm. Um, you know, as I you know talk to them just about this simple issue of anger um, and disproportionate anger, and we flesh things out more and more, you could see, and as well as they reflected back to me afterward, you know, how it was that they could go back with that understanding and maybe answer some questions as how they ended up where they did. Mm-hmm. And they were been looking for answers. Yes. Right. So I know a lot of people think, oh, you just go in and you just tell them that God loves them. But that's that's a part of it. They're looking for conversion. But they need to understand what is wrong. They need to understand the mechanics uh, of what happened. And when you say, hey, look, 
you know, your 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 cognitive faculties that you you know your 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 intellectual will are supposed to be ruling the roost here, and your passion is just just exploded, yeah. and n- nobody you know when when you have a firebomb of anger go off, it's not going to be pretty for anybody. You've not had the formation to curtail any of that. They've never just had, the opposite, and they've had no understanding of their own inner working. Yeah. And if they had a little bit of this rational psychology of formation. Of about what's going on, mm. they might have a greater fighting chance. Not the least of which, of course, is dealing with you know drug addictions and drug problems and alcohol addictions and alcohol problems, um, and general family dysfunctions and things that, that lead yeah. to, as we might say, core wounds, profound wounds uh, that that cause a desire for need uh, for um, self soothing, as well as uh, maybe even a type of rebellion. So you have all those things kind of going on. But they need yeah. real answers it's because a, they they have to get out of this this I, hole that they're in. Right, the spiral. They need the real self, answers. Right, that's kind of a hell. It is, and it and so when they they see a light and you're saying something that they that sparks something true, and they're grabbing onto that and they are assimilating this because they are trying to find their way. They're also trying to understand how they got there. You well, take that with an experience of yes, we love and care about you. We know you did bad things, and people, we also love and care about the people that got hurt, right? But we, we're here for you now, and yes. um, but it, that's not enough. Well, imagine you, it's not especially enough. when you're going back to think about just one spot in time, mm-hmm. and you're trying to make sense of that one spot in time that, that completely altered the trajectory of the rest of your life. You know, I think about the, the great book by C.S. Lewis, um, no pun intended, The Great Divorce. Mm-hmm. And in the Great Divorce, there's this place called Greytown, which is either the sort of antechamber of purgatory or it's just permanent hell. And in this Greytown, for those of you who have not read the book, um, you can kind of create your own world. You can imagine it and you get it, but you get it and that none of it's actually real and you know it's not real, which makes it that much more of a hell. It's a projection of your own mind. And so... What happens in hell is people live further and further away from each other because they keep they can't you know, stand, each stand each other, and so and yet they want communion. They're, they they're want tormented communion. By and so there's this there's this image of Napoleon that they went out to go see, thinking that he'd be a really interesting individual to talk to. These yeah. people that are in hell, and so they, they they take the thousand year trek to go find him, and he's just walking back and forth in this palace of Versailles that he's imagining that's sort of existent but not existent except in his mind. And he's walking back and forth, saying, "It was Josephine's fault." Yeah. It was the general so and so's fault. Stuck right? in the it moments. Was the, he's stuck on that same mm-hmm. moment of the loss of the Russian front. Right. And that's where I could see these guys getting without the light of the gospel and the, and the teaching of the saints, the doctors of the church to say, this is who you are and this is why this happened and here's how to get out. Right. Even if you can't get out of the prison, you can get out of your mind and out of the sin. Right. Mm. And that's where it happens. I mean, it's an interior journey. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, you know, I encourage them. When they go back and say, look, you know, do not lay out this big program in your in your mind about what you're going to do exteriorly. But, you know, it's it's let, don't start there. Yeah. Start inside. Yeah. Start on your interior. Yeah. And start. <sighs> That's it. You know, start inside there. Lay some roots and then look for strategic moments for that to have expression. Right. But. But if that, you know, if that little expression gets chopped down by somebody's, you know, sickle because they're full of hostility and anger, that same root will spring up yet another branch. That's a good way to put it. Um, but if you just start with a branch that has no roots, if that thing gets shot down, you're back to where you started. Yeah. Nothing good. No, yeah. no real change occurred. Which is us on the outside have this difficulty, right? That instead of changing something interiorly, that we need to change to be able to to get out of our personal little prisons and right. vices that we're stuck with and the, the spiraling mental cliffs that we go over. We can change our external environment constantly. Right. So it's never to deal with the interior life. Right. Just keep changing it externally, get a new plan externally, do something else externally. And as the saints say, it's one of the greatest forms of that, that sin we call sloth or achadia because it's it's this sort of constant frenetic movement like it's, Napoleon. Did. And it's also delusional in the sense that it allows you to 
to maintain an illusion. Yeah, that you're making progress. Something deeper. Well, you're yes, exactly. You know, it, in as many long ways, as you post it. Well, <laughs> if you don't post it with a peace sign, let everyone it didn't see really it. Exist. Yes, always post your delusions. So, <laughs> well, you know, I was. I got to say, the funniest thing about about these sort of everyone posting their their, yeah. their pic of this, that, or the other. I've been on the receiving end of a lot of those. Not the one they're taking a photo, of course, but right. but like take a picture of this for me or whatever else. Right. And you get to see the the before and after, and the photo looks great. Mm-hmm. The reality before and after, I mean, it's like, <laughs> it's yeah. like you just projected a life that does not exist. Exactly. For exactly. you especially. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I then get you have it. to live with that. Everyone is staging a moment. Then you have to live with that, yeah. saying that's not really my life. Yeah, that's not really my life. But, but you know, it kind of reminds me, and are we... Yeah. Okay. So th- this will kind of be my last thing. Okay. All right. Before we go. Before we go. So it it all reminds me of phenol. Of what? Phenol. Okay. It's a chemical. Yeah, I don't so, believe in chemicals. I believe what, in the angels. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole nother podcast, isn't it? So my auntie's. When I was in an undergraduate chemistry lab, we were. Oh no! Here we go. We were using this a chemical. Is be a, strap no, it no, in. No. Put your feet up, people. No, no, this is a good one. So we were using a chemical <laughs> called phenol. Now, you know, college kids, we're not real keen on reading all the warnings. Yeah. You're just kind of like, oh, what do I need to do? And you dive into it. So somewhere in this in the middle of this three-hour lab or small quantities, but nonetheless quantities of phenol were involved, uh, the professor just announced, make sure that you read all these materials regarding safety, uh, especially when handling a phenol. He said, because it will burn your skin. However, you should know that the first thing it does is deaden the nerve ending, so you won't know that it is burning and blistering. How deceptive of a chemical and is you, that? And we all looked down. Half of us had blisters on our fingers because it, that's it. And you realize in that moment, I wish I had had pain. Oh, this is a great topic. Maybe we should do it for the this next one. This is a great topic. I wish I had had pain. It would have worn yes, me. Yes, it would have And I would have been able to wash it off. This is and it's a great, great topic. Kind of that whole idea of just uh, leaving on the surface of things and keeping ourselves so preoccupied and busy yeah. that we're numb uh, and we're not allowing ourselves to experience maybe some pain that needs to be experienced or to look into some areas that need looking that are otherwise challenging to us. And it allows us to kind of circle around them or avoid them or skate above them. Yeah. But it's a bit like that 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 analogy of phenol. See, it wasn't that bad, right? No, it was, it was real. I thought lesson. you know usually when we do before we go, it's something like, like lighthearted food. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wanted to get this in because it was really no, to it's previous great. Topic but let's and, let's bookmark that because you know I think I might have mentioned this in a previous episode, but you know Saint Thomas says this great line I found in the sentences once where he says that God is the author of pain. Mm. We don't want to say that because we think. The pain of sin, which he's not the author. We're the author of that one. But the actual pain, of course he's the author. That's why you have endings on your the tips of your fingers, mm-hmm. the nerve endings, etc. You need a certain modicum of pain to, to live in a world where you're going to bounce off against things. Feedback. You need feedback, feedback yeah. in a physical, real world. And tuning it out does not mm. make it go away. It, things get worse. Yeah. Awesome. So what's your, uh, before we go on that? Well, I, I learned something today. You know, I'm dealing with uh, the new building we're going to be putting up soon, the chapel and all the other environs, et cetera. The, all these. How much you complicate my life? Yeah, I do. That's one it's thing. It's a complicated process. A, but yeah. I'm in the phase now. We're moving into construction documents mm-hmm. soon, which means that there's just a meeting every single day about something. Yeah. And today we were dealing with some HVAC problems. And and um, I learned about For those of you listening, HVAC means like air conditioning and heating. Yeah. So I think most eating, homeowners like, probably know what that well, means. Well, I, I never heard the word HVAC. Because you weren't a homeowner. No, no. Well, <laughs> we no, live we, in a weird world we had, with priests. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. We had like boilers and... That's true. You were up, you north, know, up in the Northeast. Yeah. Like We didn't have HVAC so units. Geothermal is really cool. Okay. I, I, I won't be able to afford it. Um, it's like so four, times, it's the four times the cost of, of normal HVAC. Um, but basically, it's a massive radiator underneath your land. So instead of putting the water into small coils, right, and changing the temperature, you're heating the floor. Yeah, but so you know the building itself. Yes, well, not just the floor, right? You can even air conditioning because if you go down so far, imagine soil is keeping, the soil is kept at a at at a cool temperature when it's hot outside, warm when it's cold outside, and so you're 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 just you're putting it through coils in the ground that they put in. Oh, so so you're cooling. You're cooling 
in in well in the, in the w- summertime you're cooling it, in the wintertime you're you're warming it because it's 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 warmer than the ambient air. Ah. So you you spend very little. It's massively expensive to put in. To itself, because I mentioned it's well, quite a a lot of linear feet. Of oh, it is, but it's tubing. really really a cool idea. Plus, yeah. you don't have these big units hanging out everywhere. Um, if you spring a leak, ugh. yeah, there's. There, I was talking about that, but I just thought it was so cool that someone looked at a radiator or whatever the the normal processes by which this stuff Let's happens. Let's use the earth said, for that. Let's yeah. just use the earth for that. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, I is. wish I could well, do it. So if you would just provide me with that extra cash, we're going to go geothermal and be very green. Are you talking to someone at the other end of this? Uh, you, someone out in the no, no. I'm world. talking to the vicar general right here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's time to go. <laughs> God bless you all. Uh, Talk yes, to you soon. God bless you all. Ciao now. Bye bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of From the Rooftop. For updates about new episodes, special guests, and exclusive deals for From the Rooftop listeners, sign up at Rooftop podcast.com and remember for more great ways to deepen your faith check out all the spiritual resources available at tanbooks.com and we'll see you again next time from the rooftop rooftop